um, rotator cuff repair, trying to develop this for our patients. And then biologics uh, to enhance and speed healing. We, we talked about using microfracture. I also am uh, using PRP in many cases to try and improve the healing and speed up the healing of the tendons. Uh, I'm hopeful that in the future we'll have even more options uh, for this. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank the Indian Arthroscopy Association, uh, Indian, Arth Indian Arthroscopy Society for the opportunity to present, to share my work over the last two decades. Uh, it's really a great honor. Uh, I always learn more than I uh, share, and I'm sure I'll learn a lot in the Q&A. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight, and I uh, hope this uh, helps you all with the care of your patients and to get better outcomes uh, for our patients, because that's what our, what our ultimate goal is. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. I mean, indeed, it was a wonderful presentation. So if you can unshare your screen and we can uh, start with some questions which have come up in the chat box. So, uh, Shriyash, if I can just start with the first question which has come, Please, and yes. then you can carry on. Uh, uh, it's still, it's still there, uh, so we need to, yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, in your presentation, uh, Dr. Minip, you said there is a procedure called as cortical augmentation if the bone quality is poor. So how do you exactly do that cortical augmentation in a place where bone quality is poor when you plan to put anchors? Yeah, if the bone quality is really poor, uh, I think those are challenging cases. Um, in most cases, uh, I think just planning for it ahead of time, placing your anchors immediately next to the articular margin. There's usually good bone there, and then going far lateral, there's usually good bone there. And then just being careful not to decorticate the bone at all so that you, the anchors you use have good fixation. If, however, the bone, and even when there appear, it appears there's a cyst on the MRI, you can usually just fix it with anchors. But there are cases where the bone is just really poor quality. In those cases, I sometimes will do an open procedure and I'll use a small uh, stainless steel button plate. Uh, Christian Gerber has described it, Synthes makes it, um, and I'll, I'll do a transosseous repair and tie the sutures over the button. Dr. Willis, this is Dr. Samantha from Calcutta. So, uh, really, this le lecture was fantastic. The thing is that when you use this, this three, four, and three meacus medially and three on the lateral with your fiber tapes, do you feel that these fiber tapes are going to strangulate the tissue? Because tissue quality in the uh, the healing potential in the rotator cuff is extremely poor. Do you have anything or uh, your idea that the, the, the fiber tape or the, the anything like your, the fiber sutures? I think that's a great question. I think that um, my experience has been. Initially, I think when I moved to double row repairs, I, I think I was probably strangulating the tissue and that was not with tape, that was with sutures because I was doing all these complex type of repair patterns and tying knots and doing kind of uh, Mason Allen type sutures arthroscopically and putting them fairly close. I think since I've gone towards the tape and spreading the construct out, that really I don't, we don't strangulate the tissue um, there's a study by Gus Mazaka that showed that when you tension the, the sutures initially or the suture tapes initially, that there's stress relaxation that occurs within the first hour or so after it's placed that it, it probably loosens up a bit. So I, I don't think it strangulates the tissue and that's not been my experience. I, I mean, we followed the patients now for 10 years. We don't have uh, high, high numbers of type 2 tears with these. Uh, types of tears, which is something we, we, you would think we would see if we were strangulating the tissue. So if you place them about 10 to 12 millimeters apart and you compress them tightly, uh, but you know, not excessively, I, I don't think you're going to strangulate the tissue. Okay. Thank you. I think it needs to be, I mean, I don't know the answer to this, that it needs to be strong enough to hold it in place, um, but no stronger. Um, and I don't know, just, you know, I, I don't know, we don't know that how much tension on the, re, the repair is, is helpful versus how much is, would become detrimental and strangulate the tissue. I do yeah. know that tissue doesn't heal to a foreign body, although in the second looks I've had, the tissue does grow on the tapes. But, um, so by putting in a lot of foreign material, I think you can inhibit healing. But I, I think it's hard to really over-tension these. Thank you, Peter. 
Uh, uh, there is a question here. Uh, at three and a half months, you said you clear all the patients for almost all the activities. Uh, our experience is that we actually tend to be a bit more safer and we take a lot more time. Yes. To so is it that your technique which is somehow are you dealing with more acute years? So what in your practice is uh, the reason that you are confident to send them to almost all activities by three and a half months? I think it's a combination of things. Uh, it's evolved over time. I initially was more conservative and it was probably more like six months. But as I've gotten more confident in the strength of the repairs uh, and also treating some of these athletes and things that want to push the limits, uh, we and I've studied my patients carefully I and mean, we're not seeing higher failure rates by letting them go back earlier. Um, I've gotten more confident in letting them return. Now, I treat patients from all over the country. Uh, so although I live at the base of Iscaria, I do treat acute tears, but many of my patients have chronic tears that they've had for months. So it's not that I'm just treating acute tears. Uh, that may play a role in it, but many of the patients have chronic tears. One thing that is true in my patient population is that most of the patients are very healthy and they're very active. Because if they, if they either live in Colorado or they come here, we, we're at 8,000 feet. People who smoke a lot or have a lot of chronic conditions don't usually come to our clinic. So I think that may play a role in it, that I have motivated patients that are generally in good health. And they are motivated to get better and they want to get better quickly. Um, so that probably may be part of the reason there's a selection bias in who I'm operating on. Yeah. But I also have a lot of confidence in the repairs. As you saw from some of those studies, they're not all acute tears. About two thirds of them are chronic tears and probably one third in the series are acute tears. So, um, and we have, and uh, you know, the acute tears in our five year results did slightly better than the chronic tears, but uh, still we're, we're letting the, even the chronic ones usually return to activities of three and a half to four months. Now, if somebody's older, they have a massive tear, the tissue quality is poor, and at four months they still have pain or they're done a full motion, then yes, there are certain patients that were going more slowly and in that series, 13% of the patients were not cleared because they had some type of other problem. So, uh, you know, if, if, you have, if the patient's doing well and they're pain-free and have good motion, I think, and you feel like you have a good repair, maybe... Yes, yes. So, yes. Uh, any other questions? IPS from yes, sir, the sir, panel? Sir, Satish, Satish was asking one question. Satish? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my question is uh, uh, what is your threshold for uh, doing a, a lab dorsal lab transfer or STI? And uh, what are your indications? Are your indications are different for STI and different for lab dorsal transfer? That's a great question. Um, historically, um, massive posterior superior tears that were irreparable uh, with an intact or repairable subscapularis, uh, I would do a lat dorsi transfer in a younger patient. And that was all we had. Then reverse shoulder came along and most of the time in, in patients over the age of 65 or 70, we'll do a reverse shoulder replacement. Uh, now we also have the uh, option of doing a superior capsule reconstruction. I have moved, I, I would say that for me, the indications for an SCR uh, replaced what I was doing the lat dorsi transfer for. So a young uh, or physiologically young patient with a posterior superior tear that was technically irreparable, uh, involved with super infraspinatus tendons, with an intact or repairable subscapularis that had at least three out of five abduction strength. If they were totally pseudoparalytic, then I don't think I can restore abduction with an SCR or an transfer. So if they have, you know, they're weak, but you can help them up, then I think they would be a candidate for that. So for me, that's the, the those are the patients. I also uh, prefer minimal osteoarthritis or no osteoarthritis and minimal hamada changes on the acromion. Uh, I've looked at my results from SCR versus lat dorsi transfer, and my results from the SCR are slightly better in my hands. 
So I've kind of gone away from doing lat dorsi transfers and mostly do SCRs. I've also looked at uh, my series of patients that I did that had massive repairs where I was able to margin converge and close it and then repair it and I compared that with SCR because I was curious to know whether should I just do an SCR because the tissue quality is not that great in these patients. So it's a technically repairable tear but they have poor quality tissue or they have you know, stage three or four butelier and the supraspinatus and you can't pull it over. And what I found was that the results, even if we could technically repair it with, a, with, um, with margin convergence and releases, that those results were equivalent to an SCR. So the take home message is if you can repair it, you will get as good a result as you can get with an SCR. If it's not repairable at all, you, no matter whatever technical tricks you have, you just can't repair it, then I go ahead and do an SCR. I've stopped doing lat dorsi transfers. And if they're an older patient, I usually will do reverse. Now, I think perhaps there may be still a, a role for tendon transfer, either with a lower, uh, with an upper tear, upper uh, trap, or um, or with a um, uh, lat dorsi transfer in patients who have mostly infraspinatus tears that have significant external rotation weakness. But that's a really rare subset of patients in my practice. Okay. Uh, so that you had a question. Yeah, so I hope that was a long answer, but I hope it was helpful. No, that, that it sorted out. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so my, my question is, I think the transversus uh, double row repair, which uh, I think you are doing by open. So uh, I want to know how do you decide your cases between your double row speed bridge repair or transverse repair. Is it intraoperative decision uh, because that is an arthroscopy and this is an open procedure? So how do you decide your indications for your transverse repair? I do pretty much all arthroscopic repairs. So when, it, when, when it, I talked about transosseous equivalent, I was talking about an arthroscopic technique okay. uh, with medial row anchors and lateral row anchors connecting them. Uh, I rarely do a transosseous repairs anymore unless the patient may have like terrible bone quality and I'm doing some type of a cortical augmentation or it's uh, some type of a case where I'm doing a, a graft augmentation of a, a healthy muscle but a short tendon and I'm, I'm putting in a large graft. Uh, so most of the time these are done arthroscopically. Uh, Peter, you end up uh, using between four, six and up to eight anchors. Uh, so I mean, uh, can you preoperatively, do you have a formula depending upon the size of tear that you can tell the patient that I would end up using eight anchors or six anchors? It's a cost of issue, so that is, so have you devised some kind of formula or is it just on the table that you decide? I, I don't decide, it doesn't make a difference to us if we tell the patients ahead of time. So um, usually, I mean, you can tell by the size of the tear on the MRI, but ultimately it's an intraoperative decision making after I've debrided the tear and looked at it from all different uh, orientations. Uh, and I usually look at it from posteriorly and then I make two lateral portals, a posterior lateral and anterior lateral, and I look at it from both those tears and debride it, both those portals and debride it, and then make the decision uh, if the tear is greater than 25 millimeters in, in anterior to posterior dimension, then I usually will use more than two anchors immediately. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was an excellent uh, overview and uh, excellent talk, Dr. Milik. So uh, I have a couple of questions, if I may. So firstly, while we are at technique, uh, in, in the large retracted full thickness tears where the tear has gone up to the glenohumeral joint and we are yes. able to restore it back to the footprint when we do the trial reduction, would you consider adding a pulley across the two medial anchors? Because we are fixing the medial uh, uh, anchors at two points. So there is a gap in between. So especially from a healing perspective, do you ever consider using the eyelet sutures to just bridge across and compress that medial part of your reconstruct? Yes, I, I think that's a technique uh, that some have called like a jet bridge technique or it has different names. Um, I think in some tears, uh, I actually medialize it in some of those large tears, I'll medialize the footprint a few millimeters so that there's less tension on it. I will use the eyelet sutures 
to secure the tendon to provide additional fixation. I don't like gapping. Uh, I like the tendon to be compressed down onto the footprint. So there's a variety of different adaptations you can make intraoperatively depending on how the how the tendon is going to lay on the footprint. But those are that's one technique that's utilized, um, and I use that sometimes in in some cases. I I would say that I don't do that commonly, but that is a technique which can be used to achieve additional compression. And there's, I know that there's some surgeons that feel that that's important. It seals the, um, the tendon from the articular surface so that they don't have the synovial fluid at the tendon bone interface where it's healing. And if you were to do that in a certain case, would you yes. put your lateral row anchors first and then tie the pulley or would you tie the, the bridging or the, the J tag first and then put your lateral row anchors? I would personally probably, if I were doing that technique, I would personally probably tie, I'd probably secure it laterally first so that I achieved a broad footprint. I would worry that it might um, restrict the mobility of the tendon coming over as far laterally as it might go if you tied it down medially first. Absolutely. That's what I've done. I used to do it the cowboy way, trying the medial side first, but then the, the, the risk, uh, the concerns about retails have come up. So... I like you do the lateral row first and then do the medial. Yeah, some people have called that stitch a guillotine stitch. So, you know, I think if you tie that down, you don't want to make it extra tight. Just it's, it's, it's holding the tendon down onto the footprint. It doesn't have to be compressing it down and cutting into the tendon. Because I think the tendon is weaker there medially, and you want to try and stay in the tendon itself, not into the muscle. Um, and on some of those large tears, you know, you kind of, to pull it over far enough, you're getting at the muscle tendon junction and it's not as strong there. So you have to be a little bit, you know, that's where the judgment and the art of what we do comes in. Yes, excellent. Yeah, you have a question? Come, come, uh, IPS, if I may. Uh, coming to the partial tears, now, do you use the 50% rule to decide whether to operate or not to operate? And how do you choose between uh, takedown versus an inside to repair? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, um, I have a whole talk on partial thickness tears. I have a whole test on talk on massive and complex tears, and I'd love to come and share the, that info with you. But my approach with the partial tears is that the articular sided tears, uh, I will debride it from the from the articular side. You know, this is assuming they fail conservative treatment and they've reached surgery. So on the articular sided tears, I'll debride it. I'll look at it from the articular side. I'll look at an MRI to make sure it doesn't have significant delaminations because sometimes they'll have large delaminations between the two tendon leaflets and you, you can't always see that arthroscopically if you, unless you really have seen it on the MRI. Then I'll look on the bursal side and if the, if the tissue looks totally normal on the bursal side and it looks very healthy, then I'll do a, a pasta type repair. If however that remaining tissue looks suspicious at all, then I, I personally do a takedown and repair. For the bursal side of tears, I do the same thing. I look at the articular side, go to the bursal side. I would say the bursal side tears, I have a, have a greater likelihood of leaving the articular side intact and just doing a partial repair. The posture repairs I've gone away from more. I, I occasionally do them, but more frequently, I do a takedown and repair. When I looked at my results, the pasta repairs had the worst, they, they, they improved, but the pasta repairs had the worst results. The takedowns and the bursal side of tears had the best results. So to me that says, even if there's some people that think we're getting a length tension mismatch, I think we're leaving residual tendinosis there when we do a pasta repair and they still hurt. Because when we do a full repair, we don't have trouble with stiffness when we do a takedown and repair, I don't have trouble with stiffness. Uh, so I've gone towards a lower threshold for doing a takedown and repair. I, I don't know if that's right. It's not randomized, but um, as I've moved through my career, I've, I've done more more takedowns and repairs of the partial repairs, partial okay. thickness tears. Yes, so, uh, just, uh, just my final question. You know, yes. reg regarding your study uh, in the 70 years old and older, where you got excellent results. Now we know that there are three main variables which determine the poor outcome of the rotator cuff repair. One is the advanced age. 
second is the uh, size of the tear, and third is fatty infiltration. So did you, when you chose those 70 and above to repair them with your double row technique, was it that the extent of fatty infiltration and the tendon quality was like a slightly younger patient and that's why you managed to get good results compared to otherwise? Yes, now I didn't have time to go through the selection criteria for the, for the studies, but in, my, in our large series we didn't find, surprisingly we didn't find that larger tears had worse results. And in the older patients, we didn't find that older patients had worse results. So I think if you're careful with your selection, I think that the most important thing is probably the muscle tendon quality and the that. And sometimes prepare for those patients. They usually are getting a reverse shoulder replacement or conservative non-operative treatment with injections and physical therapy. So it's probably somewhat due to the selection. This is not all 70-year-olds with rotator cuff tears. This is all 70-year-olds who are, you know, physiologically pretty active patients who have repairable rotator cuff tears with Goutelier 3 or less uh, muscle tendon quality. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, Pradeep, yeah. Yeah, my question was quite similar to what the third question um, Shires has asked. Or you have an extensive experience with uh, 70 plus. So do you do something differently with them because obviously um, uh, you are getting good results. Uh, also, um, what do you find that like are able to get good ASCS and dash scores? Are they able to maintain it? Uh, you know, for like durability wise. So do you do anything differently with uh, 70 plus? What about same? It's pretty much the same approach, although if they're a little bit older, we may be a little bit more conservative with letting them go back to uh, healing. We, you know, we have a post-operative protocol where we ask them not to use anti-inflammatory medications for six weeks. Uh, if they're a smoker, we usually don't, you know, we try not to, we don't have very many smokers in our series and we encourage people that are smoking not to smoke. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we usually we use PRP in those patients as well uh, at the time of surgery. And we're very careful about uh, preparing the bone carefully uh, so that it's bleeding, but that we're not decorticating it, so we're not weakening it, weakening it, all, it at all. Um, but other than that, there's not significant differences uh, between that and our younger, our younger cohort of patients. I have minimum two-year follow-up. I have, I know some patients are doing well at, at, at 10 years after a rotator cuff repair that were in their 70s. For example, that case that I showed you, which was the cardiologist from Texas with the rotator cuff repair, I know he's 10 years out now and he sent me a letter saying, thank you, you know, I'm doing fine. Uh, so he's doing well. You know, his activity level decreases as it, all, as, as it does for most people as they age, but he's still not in pain and he's able to do the activities of daily living and he's sports that he enjoys. In PRP you do intratendinous or you do the microfracture and get the biologics working? So you said you use PRP also. So we, is it we inject PRP at the time of surgery. We drain the joint and then we close the portals and inject PRP and bathe the, the area in PRP at the time of surgery. Uh, We're the looking at BM using BMAC and we're looking at doing PRP, you know, post operatively. It's 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 a covered service if it's done intra-op, it's part of this, the global fee for surgery. If we do it afterwards, then it's, insurance doesn't always cover it and patients you know, have to pay out of pocket. So we usually don't do it. It's just a practical uh, reason why we don't do it post-operatively. Uh, Dr. Millet, in a type A type of tear of a muscle tendon junction, in addition yes. to the speed bridge you said, you would actually do a tendon to tendon repair as well? Yes, I usually use the eyelid sutures from the medial anchors uh, and I do a tendon to tendon repair as well uh, just, to an just to hold it in place and anatomically reduce the tendon to the tendon and that seems to work really nicely for those tears and then I'll use a shaver underneath the tendon leaflet that's left laterally so that there's tendon is reapproximated down onto the bone. So that tendon is sewn to the bone and to the the tendon stump that's that's lateral. And I, I've seen those mostly, they've occurred in, in revisions, but I have seen a number of primary type two tears uh, over the years. And the patient never had, you know, never had a prior surgery and they've torn it in the tendon 
as opposed to off the bone. But but in a chronic tear, when when the tendon itself is so small, so do you modify yes. your clinical technique? How do you, do you augment it, or how do you do it? Yes, uh, I would consider that like a type B, where they have a healthy muscle and a type and a short tendon. And in those cases, I will do a speed bridge type repair or transosseous equivalent with tapes, but I'll incorporate a patch over it as well, and I'll augment it. And those I sometimes will do. I still do those sometimes open because if it's a larger tear, there's a lot of sutures and suture management. Um, and uh, we have a we have a video on that and a paper on that as well that um, shows the technique. But I usually if the if the tendon is very short. I think those are the ones that may really benefit from augmentation. Um, the other ones that may benefit from augmentation, and you, you've all probably seen these, are the patients that I call them, they have severe tendinopathy. The, the tendon is intact, but it's all stringy and it just is really poor quality. And you put the sutures in and it's like sewing, you know, just a frayed rope or wet tissue paper. And in those cases, I think maybe uh, augmentation with some type of a, Collagen scaffold would make sense as well. So, so you repair it, then put a scaffold over it, and then stitch it back. I don't know what to do. I, I have, you know, I, it's something that it's kind of a, a concept that's evolving in my mind as as we start thinking about using these patches. But I've what I've done is I've repaired it, and then I've either incorporated the patch into the repair or put the patch over the top. I, I don't have. I don't have a set method yet, but it's something that is an evolving concept that I'm, I'm thinking about because I've, I've seen those patients where, and you probably have seen them too, where the, the tendon just looks really terrible. It's not a big tear or anything, but it's just really poor quality tendon. And I think maybe we can help those with some type of biologic scaffold. Uh, as we understand, do you now calculate the critical shoulder angle in almost all your patients for a rotator cuff repair and then try to modify it? Yes, I would say we modify, if you just do a standard acromioplasty uh, with an anterolateral acromioplasty using a cutting block technique, you will modify it slightly. Uh, but if the, if the critical shoulder angle is larger than 35, um, then I also will consider doing a lateral acromioplasty. And particularly if, it, if the acromion slopes down too, then I think those are the ones that they can get lateral impingement, uh, I think, from the acromion. Uh, you know, acromioplasties are a controversial subject um, there's a, a lot of debate about whether we need to do acromioplasties or not. I, I believe that there is a, 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 a conflict that occurs between the tuberosity and the rotator cuff and the undersurface of the acromion. Whether that's primary or secondary, you can debate. But I think there are certainly there's certainly biomechanical evidence that a lateral extent of the acromion or severe hook can uh, anterolaterally can be problematic. But in any of your data, have you seen a CSA on the other side which is asymptomatic and maybe patient has got a normal CSA of 35? I don't know the answer to that. You know, we don't usually get a, a x-rays on the asymptomatic side. It's a great question. It would be really interesting in natural history study to look at that and see if, you know, patients with elevated CSAs yeah. develop rotator cuff tears. Uh, we don't... We, there's no longitudinal study that has looked at that that I'm aware of, um, but it would be really, it would be a great natural history study and maybe we should start getting x-rays on the contralateral side just to, just to look and see what their CSA is. We know that many patients get, you know, bilateral disease yeah. um, back, and that yeah. might be a reason why. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so personally and on behalf of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, I'd like to thank you for participating. We really appreciate you taking time off and uh, talking to us and sharing your experience. And we look forward to a collaboration in the future and hopefully we'll get you to India when everything settles down. You have a well, good Well, thank you very much, Suresh. It's uh, my pleasure. It's a great honor for me to be invited. I'd like to thank all the faculty for taking the time. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all in person soon. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> thank you. Very much. Uh, friends, uh, thank you for attending this webinar today. It was our 50th webinar. Thanks to the entire team of Indian Arthroscopy Society Executive including our dynamic secretary, Dr. Samantha, and our executive committee members. Uh, we have uh, another good webinar tomorrow, and it's on anthropology. And the master of ankle arthroscopy, uh, Professor Wandeji.
from Netherlands. He is going to join us tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, again, I must thank Dr. Shriyar for arranging uh, such a wonderful personality to talk to all of us. Uh, we have been seeing his cadaveric videos on ankle arthroscopy and have listened to him numerous times, but I think it would be a treat for us to discuss one-on-one -on -one about ankle instability. So tune in to IES YouTube channel tomorrow at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, for this uh, ankle instability webinar uh, hosted by Professor uh, C. Uh, Nick Wandiji. Thank you very much, friends. Thank you, Dr. Millet. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Yeah, good night. So can we... Uh, ending the stream now? Yeah, end the stream, please. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.